and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today in the show, we have Shivana Naidu. She is a child psychiatrist and she wrote the Kevin MD article, How One Word May Have Hard My Patient. Shivana, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kevin. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? I have always wanted to be a doctor since as long as I can remember myself. And uh, when I was 14, my dad died of cancer. So that made me want to become a doctor even more, uh, not to do oncology, actually, but to do palliative care, because I felt like the way he died and passed in the hospital could have been better. So that really pushed me to pursue medicine even more. But third year, you explore everything, right? So I explored Mm -hmm. Um, psychiatry as a third year medical student. And I was on call with a resident and there was this six-year-old child who had been really aggressive and she had been fighting and we were called to do a consult on her. So as a lowly med student, I had to go talk to the six-year-old and, you know, I sat in the room with a six-year-old and you could see in her eyes, it was just, she had just been through a life lifetime of trauma. You know, you could see that it was, she was yellow and green and fiery and hurt. And when I went into the room with her, I didn't know what to say. I I didn't know how to talk to her. I didn't know how to engage her. So we just sat in silence and looked at each other. And what was interesting is that in that 10, 15 minutes, which felt like eternity, I could feel her anger. I could feel her pain. I could feel this defiance, this courage, and this audacity to just live. And, you know, I left the room feeling like a failure because I didn't do much. But I also left with a conviction that this is what I needed to do. I needed to go into the field of medicine to reach these kids, to help these kids, to empower these kids, to give them a voice. So then I pursued child psychiatry and I've been doing it for about the past five years, living the dream in outpatient child and adult psychiatry. Now I work at a a exclusively outpatient child psychiatry um, nonprofit where I have tons of support. I have case management and therapists and it's really a utopian place because I have everything at my fingertips to help kids. And yet I still feel really limited. And I feel like I have not been doing as much as I could do to really help kids. So that really has helped force me to expand myself even further. And I have become a life coach. I am signing up to do integrative psychiatry to further subspecialize. I wrote this article for Kevin MD. And I also started a podcast called Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, Child Psychiatrist, which is really to provide education and information for parents and for young people going through their own mental health crises to really give them the tools to think through how to get their best mental health care. So that's where I'm at. So tell me some of the typical cases that you see on on a daily basis without getting into too much detail. What, What are some common scenarios that you find yourself in? Because I work uh, at a nonprofit, there's a certain type of patient that will come to me. They tend to have lots of socioeconomic challenges, uh, lots of ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences. Uh, So lots of trauma, but also very typical ADHD, uh, concerns for bipolar, concerns for mood disorder, for oppositional defiant traits. Um, But my my type of patient now, because they've had so much trauma, really is kind of delving through how physical trauma, neglect, sexual trauma may come out looking like ADHD, ODD, these labels that we put on kids. But really the root is from some kind of trauma or neglect. Um, But I also get a fair share of, um, you know, bread and butter, anxiety and depression as well. And of course, uh, we're in the midst of another wave of the pandemic, right? So can you comment on how the last couple of years has affected some of the cases that you've seen? You know, so what's interesting is that I think the pandemic um, has really hit hard those of us who are performing at or above level, those of us who are used to performing well in how society typically functions. I think for my population of kids who have always been challenged, they actually have done kind of well with the pandemic. My OCD kids are confirmed that the world is scary. My anxious kids don't have to go outside and go to school. And um, the kids I've seen come in have been the more higher functioning kids where taking away the social uh, Mm -hmm. interaction has really reduced their coping strategies. But I think that the level of uncertainty that's come about now the, the misinformation, the confusing information from the medical community, the media has really provoked a lot of fear in a lot of people across the board of what to know, what to expect and who to trust. And I think that that, um, that shakes the grounding and foundation of security that a lot of kids have. 
I think there's been a lot of economic instability in parents. There's been a lot of changes in routine, which for kids with spectrum has been really challenging. Um, so it's it's strained us all, I think, in and outside of the mental health care system. We're still we're still going through it. There will be PCSD, post post COVID stress mm-hmm. disorder, I think. All right, let's transition into Kevin M. The article and story that you shared. It's titled "How One Word May Have Harmed My Patient." Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Sure. So as an outpatient psychiatrist, you know, I see kids that come out of the inpatient medical hospital and inpatient mental health hospital and ERs. So I had a patient, you know, throughout my career, I've had seen kids this way. And throughout my kids, you know, we intersect with kids who have been in the medical ER, receive some kind of treatment and come back to outpatient care. And for this particular situation, I had a 14 year old that I worked very hard with who came out of inpatient psychiatry. She had made a suicide attempt. I tried to help her build an alliance with her, refer her for therapy. And then between a couple of visits, um, after a couple of visits with her, working hard on this, she had another attempt. She ended up back in the ER and within a couple of hours was at my virtual visit. Mm -hmm. And when mom talked about the ER experience, of course, most parents, have a tough time with bringing their kid to a medical ER or inpatient psych. But the parent was very frustrated with me because of the information that happened uh, and was um, shared in the ER. Namely, um, someone in the ER said that the patient's suicide attempt was behavioral. So that term behavioral really shifted my parent and patient's understanding of her suicide attempt. And that created a lot of challenges for me. Um, This patient actually was lost to follow up. She has not come back to me. And I think that it just, um, you know, really crystallized how valuable words are, how powerful we as as medical professionals are in terms of the weight of our words and how it affects people. And I just really wanted to share uh, the story of how we need to be mindful of what that is. And, you know, I have so much respect for ER doctors and ER staff. They have worked so hard. It's been such a tough year and they get everything, you know, Mm -hmm. and I know from working as a consult psychiatrist, psych patients are not the favorite of the ER, right? We know that they're pretty difficult and challenging. And I know that sometimes when my patients walk in the door, there is some eye rolling, right? There's some frustration because they're going to be a challenge. Um, But I really wanted to express how I have that empathy for ER staff, but I think especially with suicide and knowing that there's been an increased rise of suicide attempts in young people. It's the number two cause of of death in ages zero to 35. And we know that really the greatest predictor for completed suicide is a suicide attempt, whether that is, you know, downing a bottle of Tylenol or scratching yourself with a paperclip, you know, any of those attempts count as being a precursor for a completed suicide. So we have to take all of that seriously. And in the article, I said, you know, there used to be something called pseudo seizures where uh, young people would have a seizure like um, activity and we'd find out it actually was linked to psychological underpinning versus having an epileptic uh, form. And we renamed that in the DSM functional neurological symptom disorder. And I think when we have um, people come in with suicide attempts that seem not as grave or serious, I think we've now started using the term behavioral in the same way, but it really is not. You know, I think that if we just call suicidal behavior, suicidal behavior, whether or not it's severe, I think it really would uh, be much more powerful for that young person and the parent and the family to underscore the significance of this attempt and continue to take it seriously and work with outpatient mental health care. So that was basically the impetus for the article. So if this scenario were to replay itself again, what should the, the, uh, the emergency room staff do? What, what would have been an ideal way to handle that situation? There are so many people working in the ER, right? There's so many levels of education and training. And it, of course, depends on what time of your shift it is, right? If you start your shift versus end your shift with a patient like this. But I think just being consistent in calling suicidal behavior, suicidal behavior. I think that, um, you know, in the article, I also touch upon someone had told the, the parent that, a medication I prescribed could have provoked suicidal thoughts, which is which is possible. Um, but I think raising it as a, a, a question um, versus this is what I think is going on, because you don't really know what's going on, mm-hmm. right? You see a snippet of what's happening in the story of this person's life. We can't uh, really 
theorize what's happening throughout their whole life. So I think just being compassionate, underscoring the significance and importance of a suicide attempt as suicidal behavior, not behavioral, would have been helpful. And um, I think that just reaffirming to the mom and the patient how significant this is and to continue to get mental health care uh, would have been important. But you know, what's challenging is that what we say may not mean what they hear. Mm -hmm. And it could have been that the doctors and staff there did all the things I'm saying, and the parents just latched onto that word behavioral, which is why I think we have to be mindful of the words we use, because we don't know which one's going to catch their ear, and they're going to latch onto and effectively change the behavior. So tell me, in the immediate aftermath, um, what did you try to do after to to remedy the situation? Um, and did you have any follow-up with the ER staff to further discuss this? Oh, wow. You know, it's so challenging, the, the collaboration between different organizations. I mean, when I get patients from inpatient psych, it's very hard to have a doc to doc. Uh, and the same is true with ER because the shifts are constantly changing. So no, I did not have a discussion with the ER uh, docs, but maybe the Kevin MD article will reach some ER staff and inspire them to think about this. Um, but I did talk to the parent, of course, and the patient, and I had uh, two follow-up visits with them before they were lost to follow-up, where I tried to, to problem solve. And, and in the article I say, I said, everything we do is behavioral, but that means that everything we do has a reason and everything we do has a purpose. And we want to make sure we understand what that purpose is and take it seriously. So, you know, our goal really is to effectively change her behavior and her choices and empower her to make better choices versus reach for the Tylenol bottle. But that takes time and that takes work and trust and an ongoing relationship. And, you know, I'm here for you if you need me. And I'm, I, and I did also tell the parents they did the right thing to go to the ER. She made a suicide attempt. There are times to go to the ER. There are times not to go to the ER, especially for psych because our, our ERs are stressed and stretched as what they are. And not all psych needs to go there if you have established psychiatric care. So that's something I do address in my podcast called Connecting to Care in one of the episodes. So, um, you know, knowing when to utilize these resources. There is, um, across the country, there are different uh, teams called mobile crisis teams. So instead of going to the ER, if you have a psychiatric crisis, you can look up online your mobile crisis team number for your county and call them and they will send a team to your home to do an assessment to determine if you really need to go to the psych ER or not. Now, in in the case of an overdose, you should go to the ER regardless, but there are many other subtle situations where you may be thinking of bringing your child to the ER but you know, we know what happens in the ER. You wait and you mm-hmm. wait and you may not get a bed and you may not be appropriate for admission. And it may be helpful to call these other teams and support systems to really do another triage and sort out if you need to go that extra step to go to the medical ER. We're talking to Shivana Naidu. She is a child psychiatrist. She wrote to Kevin MD article, how one word may have harmed my patient. Shivana, so we have a lot of general pediatricians and primary care physicians who listen to this podcast. Now, from your perspective as a child and adult psychiatrist, any messages that you want to share with your primary care colleagues, any tips and advice that that they could do better to treat some of the cases that you see in a primary care setting? I really, my hats are off to the pediatricians and primary care physicians. Um, All of my good friends who are in family medicine, they do 75% psych. You know, I mean, depression is one of the number one causes of disability in this country. So primary care sees the bulk of psychiatry, uh, depression and anxiety, bread and butter anxiety and depression. So what I would say is that um, we know that we have to keep following these patients and we know that they don't really always want the help, right? So they don't wanna come to me as a psychiatrist. They wanna come to you as their primary care doctor who knows them and trusts them. So we value your assessment and I value when you think it is beyond your scope and when it's not. And I think for a lot of the pediatricians and primary care physicians, they're really doing their best and doing a stellar job with starting SSRIs, with referring for therapy, but we know it takes time, you know? And I think that reminding your your patients who have the comorbidities of diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, um, all sorts of chronic medical conditions, we know that depression can compound your ability to heal from these chronic medical conditions. So continuing to remind your patient to reach out to us for help would be uh, wonderful. I think 
the other thing I would consider is that we know that every medication has side effects, and especially in young people under the age of 25, SSRIs have that black box warning, right? It can upregulate some suicidal thinking, not necessarily behavior and action, but thinking. So to ask those questions, to be on top of that, and if they are started on SSRI and they have the symptom of irritability, anger in particular, that is really a red flag to get them to see a psychiatrist ASAP or reduce the medication and talk to a colleague who's a psychiatrist if you can't get them in. Because irritability can really be a big warning sign for action mm -hmm. of all sorts, self-harm, uh, aggression, and really can be an adverse reaction to SSRIs, what we call SSRI activation, or even an unmasking of bipolar. So just the symptom of irritability to watch for, as well as suicidal thinking, ideation, intention, and plan. And um, you know, I had a, um, a supervisor in residency who would say, you, know, you can't bring a horse to water, um, you can bring a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And um, of course we know that adage, but she'd add on, but if you follow the horse long enough, it will get thirsty. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our job in primary care. And I lump myself as a psychiatrist into primary care. We are supposed to follow that horse, no matter what their problem is. And if they have a mental health condition and they don't wanna to come to psychiatry, keep following them, keep reminding them that there are good psychiatrists here that wanna help you and are ready for them when they're ready for us. And my final question, what's your take home message that you wanna leave with the Kevin MD audience? So my take home message would be that, you know, physicians, medical professionals, PCAs and parents, all of us, our words carry weight. Our words carry worth. So think about these words when we talk to our patients and our families. And if a psych-ish feeling smelling patient comes your way, walks through your door, just remember if the idea of behavioral flashes through your mind, that word comes into your, the background, take pause. Take pause and remind yourself that everything we do is behavioral. Everything we do has a reason, has a purpose. And we need to call that behavior for what it is. It could be confusing, concerning, worrisome, inconsistent, interesting. But if that concerning piece has suicide in it, please don't call it behavioral. Please call it suicidal behavior. Emphasize the suicidal piece because that is very serious. And if you like what you hear, please come listen to my podcast, Thinking It Through with Dr. Naidu, Child Psychiatrist. Uh, you can find that on Apple and Spotify. And um, I would love to hear from you. My email address is drshavananaidu at gmail.com. You can find me on Instagram. And uh, I'm happy to hear from you and help in any way I can. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you so much, Kevin.